Hey, Tess, thanks for joining us. Hi, stoked to be here. All right. Totally excited to have you on the show. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling great. Really excited. Um, as you know, we're going to be talking a little bit about my show, Cleaner Days, and we're actually shooting again on Saturday for the first time in a long time, so I'm giddy. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be a magnificent interview. Starting. Oh, with yeah. Cleaners. All right. So, folks, today we have Tess Sweet joining us on the Share Podcast. Tess Sweet, is that your real name or is that your stage name? Yep, a little bit of both, but yeah. A little it's bit of both. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's a story behind it, but I've been Tess Sweet legally for about almost 20 years. Ooh, okay. Please indulge us as we go along in your story. <laughs> All right, so folks, Tess is an award-winning director and writer best known for Cleaner Days, which she's currently producing right now. She even has an IMDb profile. How cool is that? I don't have an IMDb profile, but I'm working on it. So Cleaner Days- Not Day, that hard. You know, <laughs> but thank you. There are bigger milestones. Okay, so Cleaner Days is a dark comedy series about addiction written by a recovering drug addict. It's raw, it's real, it's relevant. Story follows Jasmine, a newbie drug counselor, as she struggles to wrangle a misfit crew of teenage drug addicts while secretly battling her own addiction. Cleaner Days shines a light on the realities of living with addiction and, rhyme, and reminds us there's a little fucked up in all of us. I get that right, Tess? Right. Yep, I'd say so. <laughs> it's, you know, the truth is it's hard to sum it all up into a bite-sized piece, but... That works. I think, I think that's off our website. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's complicated and it's awesome. All right. Okay. I love it. All right. So I certainly want to know more and so do our listeners, but first tell us what your normal daily routine looks like, including recovery. Um, well, I'll say that sometimes I feel like in recovery, we don't talk enough about the other ways we stay healthy and sane mm -hmm. outside mm -hmm. of like what you're, you know, whether the 12 step model or meetings or this or that. But for me, a huge part of my daily practice is exercise. Mm -hmm. And that means jazz hands for me. I do a lot of jazzercise. Okay. Try to do that every day. <laughs> yes, it's still a thing. It's not just from the 70s. Um, although oh, that a lot was of my ladies, next question. <laughs> I know. You know, Jazzercise has kind of a bad reputation in that it is seems date. You know, it seems dated. Um, right and, there with Zumba. Yeah. It, well, Zumba is a lot newer. Uh, Jazzercise is old school. And I'm there with oh. a lot of little, you know, older women. But God love them. They're way stronger than I am. Most of them have been doing it for years. So anyway. I start with jazzercise. I sort of have a morning meditation where I get up at like 6 a.m., you know, set the alarm, drink coffee, read a book. I try not to look in any, at any device for the first couple hours of my day, although sometimes it's hard when I have a lot going on. But um, I'll be sitting and reading a book with my coffee, sometimes something that, you know, some morning meditation stuff, something that might inspire me for the day. But to be totally honest, I don't do enough of that. I always, I kind of strive to do that more than I do. Um, Cause I know that spirituality is a really good foundation, but sometimes I like to just lose myself in a novel or the other books that I love to read are memoirs um, by people in recovery that um, I like to see myself in the fucked up realities of other people who have lived it and found a way to stay clean. So I've read a lot of those. I love memoirs. Yeah, yeah, me too. And then, you know, I try to go to meetings. I, but the biggest thing that I need to do every day is work somehow on my art. And for me right now, it's like film directing, filmmaking, writing. Um, but I also do... Um, three-dimensional art, painting, stuff like that. I'm just, a, I was born an artist. I, in some ways it feels like a curse sometimes because 
I wish I could have an office job like everybody else, but it's no, you just... don't. No, no, you don't. It sucks. <laughs> I know, but it pays the bills. I've never been good at that. I'm a struggling there's artist. Something be, there's something to be said for that, right? There is that whole yeah. idea of the struggling artist. Um, yeah. But uh, you know, there's some that struggling artists that eventually stop struggling. Right. Yep. The art, the That's art my eventually, goal. There you go. There you go. Well, we'll get into that. So this is the morning routine. Great. I love it. Um, then there is some, there's some recovery. Do you still go to meetings yeah. or what does that look like? I do. I, I love meetings. Some okay. people say that meetings don't keep you clean, you know, that you, um, but for me, they really have, I love them. They inspire me for my writing, especially because my show is about addiction and recovery. Um, I love meetings because I love hearing about what's going on with people in their lives. I mean, over time, it's not necessarily about staying clean today. It's also about connecting with humanity and mm -hmm. realizing I'm not alone in what I'm going through, you know? For example, like you, you know, just it's life stuff. When you get older, like my mom's really sick, it's really hard. And, you know, hearing about other people who've gone through that and it's just a reminder we aren't alone. So I love meetings. I haven't been going to enough lately. I'm telling myself um, that sometimes happens when I get really busy and I've been really busy with cleaner days. I've been traveling a lot. And then also I got cancer last year. So I had like surgery, I had chemo, I had um, radiation, all that shit. So this has been a crazy year for me, but um, I, I keep meaning to go back to my, <laughs> I have my home group every Sunday. Okay. And then I also, I do, um, oh, I volunteer at the teen unit at the camp recovery center in Scotts Valley. So every Thursday night. And those kids are really important to my recovery and to my show because my show takes place in a rehab for teenagers. Mm -hmm. um, and by keeping current and going, you know, pr present day, and hearing sort of like about youth culture and the drug culture, because it's different than when I was young. You know, I got clean almost 20 years ago oh, and everyone sure. was talking about crack cocaine, crack cocaine. Nobody talks about crack cocaine anymore. You know, They're, the language is different. They're, it's like people are talking about, the kids are talking about zannies and dabs and purple drink and all this shit I've never even heard of, you know? Right, it's a fucking, it's a game show. I, I, no, it's a video game. I, yeah, it is. And it's different. And, you know, I mean, on a sad note, a lot of the kids, these kids are losing friends to overdose at 13 and 14. That was not the case when I was in high school. It's changed. Shit is different now because a lot of the prescription pills out there, you buy stuff on the street, you know, and I've heard that, you know, a Xanax could be pressed with fentanyl and you take two, you're used to taking two, but that's a bad batch and you fucking die, you know? And the stakes are higher than they used to be. And I, I love working with the kids. I think because also because none of them really want to be clean. And I remember what it felt like. I'll never forget what it felt like to, to be in that state, you know? So let me ask you this, right? Because on top of all that, one of my, one of my questions is how do you maintain that conscious contact with your higher power, right? How does spirituality play a role in your recovery? I'd say my spirituality comes uh, in a very pra in practical form by way of my dog, spending time with my dog. It's like that unconditional love and being out in nature. Mm -hmm. um, when I first got clean um, 17 years ago, um, I adopted a rescue dog. And at first, you know, I was really nervous, like whether you know, I had what it took to take care of something because I was so fucked up and I thought, oh, I'm going to have to take her on a walk every day. But the truth is I was the one that needed to be taken on a walk. I, it, she got me out into the world. I, you know, she took me to the lake. We, I, I, it was hugely important and taught me how to love unconditionally and also taught me how to survive heartbreak because when she died five years ago, I didn't think I could ever survive that and I did so it's an amazing gift through the love of a soulmate animal 
I mean, to people who don't like dogs, like they don't necessarily understand, but people who get it really get it. So for me, my, my connection with my dog and my art, my art is hugely important. I get, when I feel like when I'm in the flow, I call it like when I'm, cause I edit my own show. And when I'm editing, I get in this sort of like Zen like place where I feel completely at peace. Um, and you're probably aware of the fact I'm dodging the God word. And uh, in some ways I wouldn't say that I'm the most spiritual person. And I'll tell you why. Um, I struggled with depression my whole life and had a lot of anger towards a God concept because I felt sort of like forsaken or like how could a God allow me to be in so much pain my entire life. And um, so I, you know, I don't have a real active prayer practice or church or God practice. There, I do love the third step prayer um, which is all about help me be of service so I can, or help take away my difficulties so that I can be of service to humanity. So I do say that prayer a lot, especially when I'm feeling stuck in my writing because I, you know, I'm writing this script and I want to be authentic and I want to write about recovery in an authentic way. And sometimes it helps to remember to put myself out of it and take my ego out of it and think, how can I serve our community? Mm -hmm. How can I serve our families and tell a story that sort of raises us all up? Uh, the contribution, right? Yes. That, that idea of selflessness, we learn that you learn that from your dog, right? Yep. So there's that oh. unconditional love. There's the selflessness, there's the service that yep. is there and I'm, I can't connect on a certain level with certain concepts or ideas. So God brings a dog into my life because yep. otherwise Amen. I'm locked, I'm locked into my house. I'm isolating. I'm introverted. I'm, I'm creating yep. in my little cave. Oh, but I fuck, I got to take the dog for a walk. Right. right. And so now all of a sudden I'm outside and there's a paradigm shift. There's a break state. And all of a sudden, I see things differently, which allows me to be even more creative because it takes me, I'll get stuck otherwise and then wonder, why am I stuck? Right? Because I'm right. stuck in the house. Right? Yep. So, you know, I mean, thank God for, for animals. If you do not have a dog um, and you do not have an ex a, a very uh, large or very expansive uh, social life, then get one. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Did you get another you dog? Uh, I do. I my I do have another dog. Her name's Pickle, okay. and I got, I got her almost immediately. They say you aren't supposed to do that, but I all I was doing was crying and smoking cigarettes, and I smoking is so I don't smoke anymore. But when all of a sudden I was smoking again, I was just smoking and watching puppy videos for like oh dude four weeks. And I finally, I broke down. I was like, I'm getting a puppy. It's the only thing that's going to help me. And it helped. I'm proud Pickle has a very different, Yeah, Pickle has a very different energy. She's not my soulmate, but I love her with all my heart. So, different. Uh, right. No, no, no. And how old was, uh, what was the name of the other dog? Lolly. Lolly. And how old was Lolly? Lolly, I guess she died when, I, when she was probably about 12 um, but she was a miracle dog. My mom found her in the middle of the highway in Mexico. Mm. It was a destiny thing. She came into totally. my life. It was destiny. Well, not for nothing, but right. my dog, well, my wife's dog was 15 years old when four, no, she was about 14 when I, when we started dating 15 after we got married. Yeah, 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 yeah. So she died 15, 16, something like that. Anyway, the end was coming. Yeah. Right? And I'm thinking to myself, when something happens to this dog, my wife is going to just, she's going to lose it. She's, she is yeah. going that, I mean, it's her baby, 15 years with the dog. Right. Yeah. And she wanted a Brussels Griffin. And so I was at a party at a, at a Super Bowl party and somebody walked in with a two month old Brussels Griffin. And I lost my shit. <laughs> I said, Where'd you get that dog? 
I need to get one, like immediately. She's like, okay, well, there's only one breeder in Costa Rica that actually has those. And I'm like, can you hook me up, that kind of a thing? And she goes, well, I, I think I took the last one. And I'm like, okay, well, whatever. Serendipity, the next day, the lady reaches out to me and says, hey, I talked to the breeder. She's got one left. No I said, way. Give me the number. Give me the number now, right? I, I literally, this was like, I called, it was available. Somebody wanted it. They didn't put the deposit. I got in my car. I drove to the breeder. I said, here's the money. Okay. And, and the dog was only four weeks old. Right. Oh, so, and I could, so I couldn't take her home yet. And right. take him, I couldn't take him home yet. And in that four week period of time, the other dog, Kiara starts to have seizures. And I am just like, if something happens, if this dog dies before I can bring the other one home, I'm fucked. Like it's yeah. not, it's just, it's, it's not going to go over well. Well, eight weeks pass by the dogs. She's surviving and it's our two year anniversary and I'm able to get the dog, the puppy in right on our two year anniversary, a month and a half after the dog comes home, Kiara passes naturally mm -hmm. naturally yes wow. no, she just she was at home and we saw her right like my wife just kind of sat with her and she said if you need to go quit fighting you can go and within a I few days that. she yeah she was gone she just kind of she passed and uh but thank god Rumi was already here it would have been anyway that was uh, like a weird deviation in the <laughs> that's all right Rumi. <laughs> rumi's the best dog in the world so anyway yeah so i understand right we have get a dog it'll change yes. your life right uh, it'll totally. teach you about unconditional love on ways that you could have never imagined so you mentioned totally. that you have 17 years right yep well not no fronts i friday friday my birthday's coming this friday so i'm 16 years until if i make it friday all right so well guess what this episode is going to launch in a month Oh, perfect. So I have so, 17 years, baby. There you go. That's what I'm talking about. All right. Because <laughs> I believe in myself. <laughs> so when is your anniversary date? Give us, I, I don't even know what date that is. Friday the 13th. It was Friday the 13th, 2001. Oh, dude. And it's Friday the 13th again. I know. That's why it's special. Oh, man. Uh, the witching hour begins on Friday, yep. the 13th. All right. What are the special plans? Because that's a cool, that's all cool. Um, normally, may, well, the special plan is that we're shooting. We're shooting more cleaner days on Saturday. And nice. so I am so excited about that because we haven't shot anything since we released. And we were kind of at a standstill knowing what's happening next. And uh, so that's the plan. We might do a dinner or something, but to be totally honest with the chaos of production and how few people we have working on pre-production with basically me and my husband, um, it, I'm probably just going to be up late nights working on shot lists and, uh, down at the location doing set dressing. Um, our, which my show love. cleaner days, which I love. Yeah. yeah. The show takes place in a drug rehab and we have this whole facility built out. So it's like a fake rehab. So I need to go there, fluff it up, put the stuff around the art therapy stuff on the walls and some of those like props that, you know, that make the world, make, the, make it a rehab, make it seem uh, <laughs> believable. <laughs> All right. So here's what we're going to do. Okay. Um, we're going to, we're going to dive into your story. All right. Okay. And then yes. once we're done, right? I want you to lead up, right? When you start talking about recovery, because there's 17 years. So there's a lot to talk about. Yeah. Then eventually uh -huh. that recovery time leading up to cleaner days. And then we'll, we'll really unravel, you know, how that came to be and what's the deal and all that kind of good stuff. So sure. the first question is, all right. And this is just briefly tell yeah. us the first time you drank or used drugs, how old you were and how it made you feel. I'd say, I think I was 13. It was at a party in some, in my best friend's basement. And we drank and smoked weed and like played truth or dare or spin the bottle or some shit. So from the get go, yeah. were like boys were involved, you know, 
Yeah, all those hormones, all those confused emotions. Yeah. Yeah. I think I gave my first hickey. Maybe I got one too. Um, I but forgot about uh, those. I know, right? Um, but it was fun, but it was also from, I could tell right away that it was fueled by discomfort and feeling socially mm. awkward. And they were a bunch of kids I didn't know. There were some older boys and there was this fear factor. But then the moment I drank that, you know, whatever, what's it called when you just put all the stuff from your parents' liquor cabinet into one, a kamikaze. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. You drink a little, <laughs> I know. I know, I think it was, so, yeah. But I remember like drinking kamikazes, like my first hit of a little joint and then eating a charms pop after that. That's my memory. And then a lot of gross making out with somebody with braces. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like an amazing memory to hold you all <laughs> over the years. <laughs> I know. I know. All right, all right Tess, cool. you are ready to rock and roll. So now... <laughs> It is time for me to turn the show over to you. It's time for you to share your story, the battle against drugs and alcohol, the wreckage it caused in your life, when you hit rock bottom, and then finally your journey into recovery up until today. So Tess, please take it away. All right. So, well, I'd say I often talk about the the story behind the story of my um, addiction is that I'd say it has to do with depression and being born sad. I've always struggled with depression my whole life. And I think for a lot of us, self-medication, you know, is a term that you hear thrown around a lot. Yes. Um, I mean, my family loved me. My parents, they were not drug addicts or drunks. Um, I had, they loved me. Certainly there was a divorce and I think maybe, and both my parents worked. So I spent a lot of time at home by myself or with my sister. And I think that we lived in sort of a bad neighborhood and I lived... All I did was like watch TV and eat. That's what I feel like what my childhood was. And in some ways I feel like too much television sets you up for addiction because you don't learn how to entertain yourself or be with the silence. Um, But also, like I said, I think there's always this sense of discontent. You know, I lived vicariously through the lives of these TV characters. I always wanted the lives they had, not the life I had. Mm-hmm. I always I often struggled socially at school and feeling different and but more than anything I think that there was this thing deep thing in my gut where I just didn't want what I had I wanted what my friends had there was this one little girl named Candace who all the boys liked and I went to her house and she had all the junk food she had the fruit loops and the pringles and we had health food at my house it was like I just wanted other people's lives that wasn't my own um And fast forward to high school, I think everything changed when my hormones kicked in. Like when I was 13, literally like my hair curled, I used to have straight hair and all of a sudden I had these giant curls, like something switched in my biology. And uh, I think my depression got worse. Also, I was really chubby and a hard time at like... I liked boys, but they didn't, they always liked my friend and not me. I was that girl. And so there was a lot of, um, loneliness associated with that and relationships have always been like a big issue for me where I'll love somebody with all my heart, put them on a pedestal, worship them, and then feel like I cannot live without them. You know, absolutely can't live without them. And that shit sent me to the psych ward when I was older. Um, (laughs) but I'll get to that. Codependent. Um, yes. Yeah. Huge. And, you know, it was in those high school, I went to a, a, a art hippie school on a farm in high school where there were a lot of people whose parents had a lot of money. And so there was a lot of more heavy drugs there than maybe other schools. Like there was a lot of cocaine and acid and ecstasy. And these were all things I'd never done before. But when I got to the school and I'd say, you know, as my depression grew that, and my access to these (laughs) substances grew, it was just like the, you know, perfect storm. Perfect storm. Yes. Thanks for, yeah. And it just, but still it was just like drinking weed. I probably did more than the average person. It was just very prevalent at my school. Um, 
but that's true for a lot of kids these days. I mean, it's just everywhere. But anyway, but what I noticed is right away, as people were sort of graduating from high school, people had a plan or a dream, like they wanted to be a nurse or they wanted to do pre-med, be a lawyer, blah, blah, blah. And I just never really had a dream and never knew what I wanted to do. And so I found that smoking weed or drinking just sort of helped me put it off till tomorrow, you know, and I was watching people go off and start their lives and I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I just kind of used that as an excuse to party more. You know, I, uh, when I graduated from high school, I sort of like went on a road trip and I met a boy and we were going to, I wanted to be in a band, but I didn't have any musical talent. You know, <laughs> I was living in a band <laughs> and I was like, yeah, as, um, exactly. Uh, Groupie. but all through Groupie. that, yeah. Um, but through all this, it's like, I've always been artistically inclined and, um, uh, I'll fast forward a little bit to the trauma that changed me. And that was when I guess I was like 20. Um, I was a victim of a violent crime and uh, it changed my using from uh, a party to seriously checking out in a way that I never pictured my life. Um, I was actually... I was with two guys when it happened. And usually when you're a woman alone, you are on guard. Like you aren't sort of like aware, uh, or I'm sorry, when you're alone, you are on guard. But when you're with a couple guys, you sort of let those guards down. And anyway, we were, I was with my boyfriend at the time and another big tattooed guy. And um, we were jumped by two guys in the bushes who had guns. I was raped at gunpoint. It was horrific, really scary. And um, it, changed me. And I think after that, there was like this loss of hope in the world. Like I was raised in a hippie, peace, love and happiness household, believing that everybody is good in their hearts. And after that happened to me, there was something in me that just sort of shut down. Like I didn't believe in my fairy tale world. You know, I grew up, my dad read me fairy tales every night and about princes and princesses. And that was the life I thought that was in store for me. And I realized that there's true evil in the world and the world is not a loving place. It's a dark place. And I think a week after I testified against the guys who did it, I shot heroin for the first time. And I never pictured that life. For, I mean, I never in a million years would have thought that for myself. You know, I come from a good family, I, all that stuff. And I mean, I don't think anybody, any IV drug user ever thinks back like, oh, I was a kid and that's what I wanted for myself. But I still have a lot of shame around the fact that I use needles, but I've also learned that if I can transform that shame into something creative, I can wear it like a badge of honor instead of hiding in the closet. But, um, yeah, that changed me. And after that happened through my 20s, it was just kind of like a cycle of numbing out, boyfriends, burning man, craziness. Like, um, But I do think that it's important. You know, I don't like to linger on the rape. And when I talk, when I sometimes will share my story, you know, when I'm asked to share, I always wonder, like, should I talk about that? Should I bring it up? And the reason I consistently go there is because I do think as addicts, sometimes trauma is what shapes the nature of our journeys. And sometimes, I mean, a lot of addicts are wounded. And this was, you know, we self-medicated with substances because, you know, um, something happened or at least that was my story. I don't honestly think that I would have taken the same path if that hadn't happened. So I know it was kind of pivotal. Um, but fast forward a little bit, what happened was during the, I, I would get various links of clean time. Sometimes I would get like 30 days or, cause there was always this voice that I feel like knew better, you know? Um, and, uh, I was never able to stay clean though. I would try to prove to myself that I could and, um, but you know, I guess I just wasn't done. Uh, like I said earlier, there were some psych ward visits. It was like, I would fall in love with a guy. He would break up with me. I would have some sort of circular spiral downward and, 
end up in the psych ward. That happened like five times. But one time, one really sad time, and this is why you should never give fronts. This is why you should not announce you have a year. Because I announced that I had a year and I had 360 days. And um, I, I went out at a suicide attempt. So I drank a six pack of beer, took a bottle of pills. After um, a guy broke up with me who I'd been dating for two weeks. <laughs> and uh, that, I know. I love with all my heart passionately. And the <laughs> <laughs> the thing I like to say is that when you are with somebody so briefly, they're so perfect. You don't even get a chance to see the downside of them. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, but I was also, I was broken. I was fucked up. And, but anyway, uh, so that happened and my mom found me. She had a weird sixth sense and she came to my house and uh, she found me in that state. I had made written a suicide note and Anyway, I woke up in the hospital and she was there crying and she made me promise that as long as she, as she was alive, I would never kill myself, that I would never do that to her again. So I signed a contract on a piece of notebook paper and um, I still honor that to this day. Um, but that didn't stop me from sort of that, you know, a week later I was using again and fast forward to my bottom which was, uh, it happened, you know, I think I had another bit of clean time and went to Burning Man, relapsed at Burning Man, met a guy there and, um, who lived in San Francisco. I was living in Seattle and I moved to San Francisco to be with him, even though he didn't really want me to. Um, but I moved what year to was a, that? It was 1999. Okay. Yeah, so many stories from Burning Man. I can I tell you, I, I, gotta, I, just, I wanna get the date to just make, was it just one Burning Man or is it like every year? How does it? I've been what? every year, I've been every year. And that's actually where I met my current husband. We still okay. go, oh, I go. Okay. But there was a time when I went when I was using, mm -hmm. now I go clean. Go, um, okay, I gotcha, I gotcha. Yeah, but that year, um, anyway, I moved to San Francisco for a guy. That's the bottom line. And when I got there, he pretty much blew me off and I didn't know anybody. And I was living at a very dangerous corner in the mission, very dangerous corner for a drug addict to live because 16th and mission back in the day, it was just like, I don't know if you know that area, but you could buy whatever you want. And it was hugely densely populated with drug addicts selling my drug of choice, which was speed balls, which is like, yeah. what do they call them back then? One in ones, one in ones, which was black tar yeah. heroin. And, and yeah, which I think it was actually crack where I bought it. But, um, uh, yeah. So I've heard of them. I've heard of the mission district. I have heard of them. Yeah. Yeah. Back then. I mean, it's cleaned up now. It's all hipsterville, but back then it was pretty sketch. And I had a, um, a terrifying overdose experience where I, it was like New Year's Eve and I woke up naked on the bathroom floor. I didn't know how I got there. I, sh I should have drowned because I was, the water was like this thick. It was like inches of water. The water had been going through the neighbors all night. And I, they, I heard them knocking and I got up and like my face was all bloated and fucked up. It looked crazy. Honestly, I wish I got a photo so I would remember forever <laughs> what it's like to be at the very, very bottom. Oof. But, uh, yeah, it terrified me. And I went in the bedroom and there was like all these malt liquor cans and I don't drink malt liquor and evidence of some uh, sexual behavior. And I didn't even remember having company that night. Um, uh -oh. So it scared me. It really scared me. And I checked myself into the hospital, um, Sequoia Hospital, and I was so sick. With detox, I think I was there for like eight days just in the detox unit. And um, while I was there, some really sweet gentleman from 12 Steps came in, like, came in with a wheelchair and was like, Can I take you to a meeting? And I didn't want to. And then a few days later, he came again and he was like, Can I take you to a meeting with the wheelchair? And I went. And um, it was this huge room in the basement of the hospital. There was like 300, it was an AA meeting and there were all these like hot guys. And at that time in my life, that gave me hope, <laughs> you know, like hot tattooed guys who I was like, wow, 
my life won't be boring necessarily, you know, and they all were radiant and healthy and it just gave me that little kernel of hope, whatever it fucking takes. Right. Yes. Um, right. And, um, the doctor there, he was actually an addict in recovery. My detox doctor, he had 20 years clean off of heroin and that helped wow. me too. And as a result, he knew about what it's like to be dope sick. So he gave me a very painless detox, which was thank God for him. Oh my God. Um, and, uh, he recommended I check into a 30 day program. I had done a couple of those before, but I left after two days and changed my mind as we do sometimes. <laughs> One of those involved a hitchhiking home barefoot, but I won't go into that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I checked into this program and for some reason I was just ready this time. I think because I had this realization. Remember I told you about the contract I wrote with my mom that I would never kill myself as long as she was alive. When I woke up from that overdose experience on the bathroom floor, there was this thing that clicked in my head where I realized for me, using and suicide are the same thing. And so for my mom, honestly, at the beginning, I did it for my mom. I didn't do it for me. You know, they say you have to do it for yourself. I don't think that's necessarily true. However, you can find a way to do it. That that's what did it for me. And ultimately I've learned to do it for myself. Um, but at first it was for her and I stayed in program. And here's what I did from the get go. I just followed direction to the T. They told me to go to this program. I went and they took us to outside meetings in Berkeley. And I went and same thing. It was like, people were really cool. Some women reached out to me and gave me phone numbers and it was also helpful. I didn't know anybody. Like I was in a different area. I was in Northern California and I, it, I had an opportunity to have a complete fresh start. You know, they recommended I move into an SLE. So I moved in back then they called them halfway houses and I was very hesitant. because so I was like, I don't want to live in a halfway house. Like that's for losers, you know, but I did that and I loved it. It was just what I needed. And I also took advantage of all the resources that are available when you're at your bottom. I always tell people this who are really like living in their cars and like, dude, take advantage of all the services that are there for when you're really fucked up that you can get food bags. You can get help with your resume. You can go to the state. You can, I did all of that. I got so I got food bags. I got help with my resume. I got um, low income housing placement for it was this killer like live work loft because I was a low income artist. And um, I also started taking my mental health as seriously as my, my addiction because I realized how intertwined they were. Um, but so not only was I living in an SLE, but all of a sudden when we get clean, all of a sudden we realize we have all this fucking time on our hands because the amount of time you spend thinking about getting high, scoring, being high, being hungover, and then fantasizing about, you know, and then it's like, it's a full-time job, right? So you take away all that crazy. And then, oh my God, I have all this time. I don't know who I am. I don't know what I like to do. Who, what am I going to fucking do? You know? And so what I decided to do was start taking some classes at community college and start also going to the YMCA. Cause my friend was like, oh, let's be gym buddies. And my friend from uh, the rooms and I never pictured myself one of those gym people and it never had been athletic. Like I said, I was really ha heavy. I was, I was kind of like a fat junkie. Yes, they do exist. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's true. And uh, I ended up losing almost 80 pounds from, and I was, yeah, I used to be a much bigger 80 person. pounds. Yeah. Man, a, yeah. Okay. Well, all right. Alcohol has a lot of calories. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I couldn't even imagine. I'm looking at you now. I can't even. It was all here. It was all I here and here. Oh, man. I can't even imagine. Wow. That is amazing. Yeah. And I lost a bunch of weight by, and you know, I started out slow. Like I did the senior aerobics class because I didn't want it to be intimidating. And I did like the yoga for uh, pregnant ladies, same thing. I thought I just wanted to like keep it slow, not, you know, and anyway, so I started going to the gym, I got a dog, I started exercising and going to meetings every day, sometimes twice a day. But 
I remember I had, my friend and I in re early recovery would joke around like with all these meetings and the gym and school, who has time to work? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't work. Yes. I put my recovery and my spirituality was my full-time job. And luckily, you know, I was able to do that. Um, but uh, so early on, you know, I really, like I said, I followed direction. I had a sponsor. Um, I got clean in NA. I spent many years in AA when I was in Los Angeles because I didn't connect with the fellowship in NA as much there. But NA is pretty much, that's my jam. I mean, it's all the, you know, AA is the mothership. I love it all. But eventually you find your people, I think, somewhere. But um, I got to say that the biggest uh, thing that I had confronted in early recovery was feeling like I didn't know who I was or where I belonged in the world. And that was very painful. And as a depressed person, like learning, like, how can I exist in the world and find my place? And the biggest thing, and this is what I tell people who are new in recovery too, who don't know or have a dream, like just open up that community college catalog and point at something, you know? And I took some computer classes and then I took a digital photography class or some shit. And then I took a video production class and then I, I just kind of ran with it. I ended up having a cable access show in Berkeley. I ended up getting a full ride. Um, I got it all paid for to go to San Francisco state and I got my bachelor's degree in film, you know, and this is like, I mean, this was just a trajectory out of the gates, just like bam, 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 just working, putting everything I had into kind of like a fresh start, following my heart, what I felt like I was meant to do. And um, it kept, it kept going from there. And to be totally honest, so I ended up getting, I went on and I got my master's in film at UCLA and, um, they get sometimes up to a thousand applications and they only take 15 directors a year. It's highly competitive. Um, but what I did with my application was, you know, they don't, you don't have to show a film in order to get into that school. They don't want to see that you have made films. They want to see that you have stories to tell and they want to hear your authentic voice. And the story I told was of my bottom. I told the story of the of my last day using but i gave it a, a comedic twist like i could laugh at myself because enough time had passed you know and i got in and let me just say it's you know it's not easy to get into that school and so what i r learned right away was that when i open my heart and come out of the shame the pace place of shame and can sort of like embrace my past and use it use my voice good things happen, you know, because like I said about being an IV drug addict, the shame is debilitating. It feels like a dirtiness you can never wash off, you know, and um, the way I have been able to deal with it is just by owning it and speaking on it, you know, and uh, it's not easy. It's still at times, you know, like there are certain people I definitely would never tell, you know, like the, you know, the mother-in-law and all that, you know, she would, she die oh my god oh my god but if, you know if she found out if she found out it wouldn't be the end of the world you know I my life's an open book eventually maybe she does know I don't know I mean who knows if she follows me on Facebook maybe she does know um but anyway so yeah I learned right away that what I'm good at is dark comedy mm -hmm. because as you know, in the rooms and in, in meetings, we are laughing a lot and we're laughing about really sick shit we used to do in the past. And that's sort of the basis of my inspiration for all my writing is giving it a spin because I'm not interested in making people cry unless it's followed with a little laughter, you know, and my show Cleaner Days is pretty much all about that. It's like addict humor, but it's also addict pain which I think there's a beautiful fine line. There's like this dance with that. You know, I'm not out to make PSAs for why you shouldn't be a drug addict. I'm not trying to be the dare campaign, but uh, 
I do think the conversation around addiction and our authentic portrayal of who we are as human is really important. So I don't know if I think that's sort of the arc of my story. I'd love to talk more about how I came to cleaner days, but I wonder if you have questions before I go there. Did no. I leave stuff out? No way. No way. I mean, here, here's the thing. Like, just I'll just interject because I have no questions, right? Okay. Here's the funny thing as I, as I just listened to your story, right? Yeah. I, w- I would have traded places with anybody. Check. Uh, I was doing tons of cocaine. I weigh 190 pounds now between a one night. I, I, I fluctuate between 190, 195. I was 230 pounds when I came into recovery and I was a daily cocaine user. So I was fat, right? Yeah. So I already knew w- what that was all about. So there's this whole, like, I'm listening to you as you're telling mm-hmm. your story and I go, yeah, that's me. Uh, it, yeah, that's right. me. So there's this, there's this incredible amount of, of just similarities that, yeah. that I'm wafting through. And I just couldn't help but, but throw that out there because it, it's like, it's the female, it's yet another female version of what I was going through, right? And that relatability right. between myself, the listeners, and just getting to that point where those of us who either were trying to commit suicide or put ourselves in situations where we were just, if we did not stop, we were going to die. Right. right. So there was, there was, it's just, what I can say is that I connect with you on so many different levels. It's really ridiculous. <laughs> right on. Love that. Love so now, that. So now let's move into uh, cleaner days. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'll say about cleaner days is, is that, you know, I'm a filmmaker and when I was at UCLA, I made a lot of short films. And when I lived in LA, I had a lot of film community because that was the world I was in. Um, I and met I'm my husband LA. and, oh, okay. I missed There's another it. Similarity. No, that's, that's another, that's another similarity. There it is. Yeah. Um, but I met my husband at Burning Man in 2009. Is that right? Yeah. And, um, we did the long distance thing for a while. Yeah. We did the long distance thing. And, uh, eventually I moved because he had two kids and he was a single parent and he has a a home and he's much more settled. And I'm, you know, if somebody was going to be to move, it was going to have to be me. So Uh I moved to a mountain. Yeah. I, uh, I moved to the Santa Cruz Mountains, which there is no place more opposite Hollywood than the Santa Cruz Mountains, like 40 minutes from a Target, uh, 10 minutes from a 10 minute drive to a little tiny Johnny's market. Um, Anyway, it was tough. It, It was beautiful and right by the woods and inspiring in some ways. But I promptly got really depressed from missing my mm. film community yep. and also my meetings because I'll tell you the one NA meeting downtown Boulder Creek is two guys and a candle in a cabin. It wasn't, I, it wasn't my jam. <laughs> it really bummed. And you know, they say sometimes you can go to a meeting and you leave more depressed. Well, I left that meeting like semi-suicidal, like this is my life. Oh my God. You try to do the similarities, but sometimes the differences are too intense, you know, and and that was hard. So long story short, oh, hold on. I got to let my dog out right here. Um, Long story short, uh, it all started with depression. Cleaner days started with some super gnarly suicidal depression, like I hadn't experienced in a long time. And I was talking to a friend of mine who is a cinematographer from UCLA, and she had started working on a show called High Maintenance, which is now an HBO show. And High Maintenance started as a web series. And um, she advised me like, well, why don't you just shoot something small with the resources you have about the world that you're in? And... um, shoot it in Santa Cruz. So it just sort of like planted the seed. And at that time I was working with at risk youth, um, a high school for kids in recovery. It's called the yes school. And it's really a magical place. And so I was working with young people and 
I was, I, something just clicked. I was like, this is a really fascinating world because teenagers, there's like, it's like this juicy time. It's, I have a lot of compassion. I'll never forget what it was like to be a high schooler and, you know, struggling with addiction. And then also you have all this layers of drama because all the people who work there are in recovery in various stages, uh, just because you're clean doesn't mean you're in recovery. Some of them have replaced their addictions with like CrossFit or juicing or, or sex addiction. And so I just thought, well, this is kind of an interesting world, you know, Very. this is like, orange, right. This is kind of like orange is the new black, but it's about teenagers in rehab. I think there's some story here. <laughs> so I just started writing and um, I wrote, I guess I wrote a one long season. We ended up splitting it up into two, but I did, you know, a crowdfunding campaign. I um, collaborated with a producer in town. Um, and let me tell you, there's not many producers or collaborators in Santa Cruz. This is like, there's no film world here. So making the show here has its pluses and minuses. The plus is that everybody is starstruck and wants to help. And that's wonderful because in LA, you don't get anything for free. And here we've gotten a lot for free. Um, but I, and from the beginning, I think what's different about this production than most productions and any other production that I've done in the past is that from the get-go, I wanted to work with addicts in recovery. So casting priority is always to people who have lived it. My first question is like, are you in recovery? Have you ever struggled with addiction? And those are the kids, especially when I'm passing for teenagers, like for example, we're shooting on Saturday and a couple of the kids, you know, one of them has struggled with weed and been in and out of like gang stuff. One of them, um, like I said, just got out of rehab, I guess 60 days ago. And like, I'm so excited to work with them because I want, if I can give them a little shred of hope that you can be a drug addict and get clean and do cool stuff. And you know, how awesome, how awesome is that? You know, because when I was in LA, when I had casting sessions, everybody comes in with a headshot and they've worked on soap operas and commercials and like, fuck all that noise. You know, I'm not, <laughs> you know, everybody's so vain and they all kind of look alike too. They there all have is, like, there, there is that right? cookie cutter sort of, right? That look like the perfectly white teeth and perfect hair and like, even the guys wear makeup and get plastic surgery. To me, it's so creepy and fake. And I pride myself on cleaner days. Like we have real people who've had real struggles, you know, and I want a multicolored cast. I want multi ages. I want to see, I want to see some scars and wrinkles and, and wear and tear like real people, you know? And I think it shows if you watch cleaner days, you'll see that there is a magic to the fact that there's some real recovery in it. For example, one of the favorite episodes is in episode three, um, the kids wrote goodbye letters to their drugs of choice, which is something that, you know, they often do yeah. that in rehab. Mm -hmm. And I had them write their own real letters. And one of the kids is my cousin who's a recovering heroin addict and he wrote a goodbye letter to heroin. And, you know, it's, fucking beautiful and profound and when we had the premiere red carpet premiere in our hometown uproarious applause it was like standing ovation at his letter and it's because it was real you know people felt it it's not like there have been other shows on tv like recovery road i mean you know good for them I'm, they're a real show they made lots of money and it's not my it's not my show recovery road there was a lot of headshots a lot of beautiful people and a lot of money in that production but i don't think it had the same heart that cleaner days has if you watch it you'll it's just like it it has this beautiful dirty raw reality that i think is truly unique and different and as we move forward and develop and evolve for television, I don't ever want to lose that ever, you know? So was that all over the place? I think I sort of lost where I was going. No, no, but this, this, is, this, <laughs> this is perfect. This is perfect. I remember when I was working in, in a rehab um, and you'd say you would write your hello or your goodbye letters to drugs and your, you know, hello letters to recovery, right? Hello recovery and that kind of thing. And those are the beautiful exercises that 
allow you to see the really creative side of these addicts because we're very, very creative people that we have mm -hmm. so much to say. We have so much to yeah. share, but there's so much going on, right? It's, it's hard to, that's why they tell you, you know, start journaling, you know, get, find some quiet time, find some time to reflect, you know, um, and then here's some assignments for you because, you know, in many cases, it's tough to just kind of put down on paper one thought because it all just yeah. kind of comes, you know, just, just powering on, on top of you. And then, so I I'd, I'd get with these guys and they would, they would do these, these letters, you know, goodbye to drugs. And they were just the most beautiful, touching, heartwarming messages. Some of them were so angry, you know, yeah. like, fuck you drugs. You know what I mean? You yeah. took this from me. You took that from me. You know, I'm yeah. never gonna, you know, and that's the thing, right? Connecting with that, connecting with that anger, connecting with that yep. resentment, connecting with the bitterness, the sadness, the depression. Yeah. In many cases, it's so much easier in that context because it's small and it's concise and you can kind of, as a counselor, you kind of see, whoa, so this is the direction yep. I kind of need to go to because this guy, you know what I mean? Like, let's get a hold right. of that, that kind of anger because yeah. I, watch too, I watch too many of them relapse because they right. just can't quite get, they can't quite get a hold of it, right? Because yeah. the other thing that I liked about what you said and what I connected with too was the beginning of my recovery journey. Mm -hmm. I just followed directions. They gave me suggestions. I took them, right? I just, I stopped thinking for myself because my thinking was broken. I had, I, I obviously had no business using my brain at the moment because it was constantly, you know, go left. I was going right, go right, go left, right? Like it was just, the, there was no rhyme or reason for what I was doing, but I knew I was lost. I knew that. I couldn't do it alone. I knew that if I didn't do something and I didn't find a place that could help me, I was going to die, you know, mm -hmm. because I was already wishing for it. Um, and so, yeah, so I think that, that so much of what we do and what you're doing too is bringing such amazing awareness to what it's like in the beginning. Like it's, it yeah. is, and it's funny shit. You know what I mean? Like rehab yeah. is funny. Yeah. Right? I, I mean, the, the, the things that they say, right, if you could, because, you know, I mean, I was working, here I was, I'm working at the rehab, and I'm, I'm, I'm teaching classes during the day, and I'm doing one-on-ones, but then I would be in my office late at night doing podcast interviews, or would be doing whatever, and my office was right next to the living area, so now you just hear them saying the same oh, yeah. shit, Right? Like, you're just like, I'm like, where was, where were they in my class? Like, all of a sudden, they're just, right, 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 right. And the conversations are just, they're comedy, right? It's, it's See, I would be writing that shit down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what my show is. That's definitely, you know, because the thing is, especially with these kids, they're drug addicts, but they're kids first, you know? Yes. Is not, I don't see, care I mean, if they're 50. They're still <laughs> kids. The ones that are, there that are 40 and 50 years old, 60. Right now, I'd be like, really? oh, there's a six-year-old, 60-year-old. Right? He's, <laughs> I mean, they're all children. Oh, that's funny. Oh, because that was uh, adults you're talking about, not even the kids. Oh, no, 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 no. We had a wide range. It wasn't It oh, wasn't okay. because I know you're in the world of the teen world. In right, right, right. We, they're all mixed in together. Oh. Wow. And they'd be bitching about that that guy, like, dude, we can't take we can't take so and so anymore. You know, we can't take so and so. He's driving us crazy. He's so old, right? And he's just <laughs> complaining and whining and pissing and moaning. We he wants to watch something different. It's too cold. It's too hot. It's this and that. You know, the food sucks. You know what I mean? I'm just tired. You know what I mean? So there's this, it's hysterical, right? Mm -hmm. And then and then he's oh, acting yeah. like you know, there's just, you know, then he's come in. And he's like, you know, trying to run game the whole time. So here's a 60-year-old oh, yeah. running game, 
oh, you know, um, do you think you can get me out of doing, oh, it's just that my back. And then it's just like, you know, my stomach's a little sensitive. Do you think you could change the, the, the meal plan a little bit? And there's just this, this constant, just this little, and it's like, did you almost die? Right? Like yeah. your sister and your mother, right, had to bring you into rehab and you're 60. Like, you know what I mean? Like, stop complaining. All right. No. Seriously. Right. And so, so that's, that's where I, I love the, I always said that I go, dude, this would be such an amazing reality TV show. They had a yeah. camera in here to watch the shenanigans that go yep. on. <laughs> Our, and cleaner days. It's like, it's sort of both. It's like hybrid reality show and scripted. Cause we have, you know, it's written, it's scripted mm -hmm. narrative, but we do a lot of improv and a lot of people who are really in recovery on the show. And I think that, you know, that's part of what keeps it super fresh and very watchable. That's why people in recovery love it. I show, I, a bunch, I gave a lot of free tickets to people in rehab to come to the premiere. And um, I talked to some of them after, and one of the guys was like, oh my God, I just wanted to watch it and watch it and watch it and keep watching to, it was so good. I wanted to watch it until it wasn't good for me anymore. <laughs> like a true addict. <laughs> You know, it was like, I just wanted to watch it over and over. And, you know, that's the thing about all these drug addicts, all of my super fans who are following me now, they're like, when season two, when season two, when season two, it's that insatiable, you know, now I've got to feed that machine of like all these people waiting for season two, um, which is wonderful and exciting. But the moment it comes out, they're going to binge it and be like, when season three, you know, so I can't rush it just because people are waiting. Correct. Correct. And the, the, here's the thing. Like I've been doing the podcast for three years. And at first people would be like, I would hear it all the time. It's like, I've listened through all the episodes. Now I have to actually wait for the Tuesday episode to come out. Right. But now there's 178 episodes. So whoever comes in new now, right. Yeah. They've got like, if they listen, if they just keep listening, they might actually make it to a meeting before they run out of episodes. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Which could slow them down. Yeah. God, I got to say, I wish it was easier for me to make content. It, take, it took us, you know, a year to make five episodes. But, uh, but editing. Yeah, no, it's you got the, the whole, that production. That's why I did the podcast, right? Podcast. Right. Right? Like we're having a conversation, you know, very, there's hardly any need for editing. We go back and forth right. for a while and, you know, I slow that up. But that took years for me to kind of get to a point where it just flowed so easily that yeah. you know, I could basically just take the episode and, 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 and kind of launch it. It's become, it's become pretty right. easy. It's like everything else takes time. But video where you have where you have to have the right lighting and the audio and then, the, you know, somebody bloopers or bleepers because, you know, it's a yeah. set, right? So the, yeah. the minute you turn the camera on, right, and, you know, anything it's can happen. Car. Right, oh, yeah. right. It's, yeah. So, so now it's like, cut! Right? And so there's yeah. a lot of that. And they, so I can understand where that, where that plays. Yeah. But after a while, I mean, hopefully the funding comes in. And, yes. you know, you'd have, you'd have like an actual, you know, like a production crew, right? And, and, yes. and, and something that, you know, if, if it's meant to be, Hollywood will pick it up and go, ooh, cleaner. Right. Days. We need to do something yeah. with this. <laughs> we keep having like, we like almost get something and then it falls through. Like Dwayne The Rock Johnson fucking loves cleaner days. He watched what? it. They were. I know his um, his company Seven Bucks Digital. They were on the they were the jury committee. They were on the jury committee for a film festival that we won best show, best series, best writing. And his company contacted us and said, "We want to meet with you in Austin. We love Cleaner Days. We want to help you amplify your release. We want to interview you on his YouTube channel." And for me, I mean, I was like, oh my God, this is it. This is our ticket. He has like 40 million followers on YouTube. We get a million hits, bam, we're done, you know? 
And it's been a school of hard knocks. I mean, it never happened. We followed up. We did a lot of back and forth with the company. Oh yeah, we're a little busy. Check with us in the, you know, follow up with us and having a hard time getting this or that. And you know, 15, 25 follow up emails later, nothing came of it. And that was almost a year ago. Huge heartbreak, you know, but that's like this fucking game. It's an, it's a roller coaster ride, which is why we're going to continue to move forward and just trust in the universe that when it happens, it happens. And when it's meant to be, you have to keep doing the footwork, but like that broke my heart. That was pretty tough. That was a tough one to swallow because it was, you know, I mean, his company sought us out. I would have never thought Dwayne the Rock Johnson was the right fit necessarily. I would think somebody like Mark Maron or Russell Brand, somebody in recovery, you know, would see it and because I'm confident Cleaner Days is fucking amazing. People watch it and love it. It's been winning awards, but it's just like getting those eyes on it and getting the right eyes on it. Cause it's hard there, you know, there's so much media out there. There's so many videos, there's so much content and how do you get noticed? You know, especially if you're the little guy, if you don't have a publicist, if you don't have an agent, if you live in Santa Cruz, like all these <laughs> things are stacked against us. You know what I mean? Yes. Most people, the first thing will be like, well, do you have an agent? Do you have a publicist? Well, I live in the ghetto. Like, I don't have any money. Like, what do you mean? I don't live in the ghetto, but Santa Cruz basically, <laughs> I mean, for how limited resources are, you know, it's like, there's no ghetto in Santa Cruz. It's like, it's, yeah, it's not the ghetto. I'm right by the beach, but in turn, it's a, it's a well, wasteland. Is, yeah. To the industry. This is a, and this is a great thing for, for people that are listening because what we're talking about here, folks, is a passion project, right? The yeah. Share Podcast is a passion, is a passion project. Crazy Cleaner Days is a passion project, and it's something that, you know, when you get behind it, primarily, it's the idea that it's something that you you can get behind because no matter what happens, right? It's part of who you are. It's it's a reflection right. of your identity you know, uh, yeah. of, of who you are as a person and what you want to share with the world. So, you know, we yeah. hear so often where somebody says, you know, if just, if, if this can just help one person, right? And so, and I'm like, yeah, you know, I started out that way, but then as soon as you help that one person and you know about it, then it's like, well, if I can help one person, maybe I can help thousands of people, right? And then, and then all of a sudden you get kind of, married to it and connected to it and emotional and then when things don't pan out right it's a tough pill to swallow but this is just like anything else like easy does it right test right. 17 years right i've got 15 years right when we started our passion project we were already in our double digits right yeah we can we can take abuse right we can take disappointment right. And kind of recognize that this is part of the deal, right? And yeah. nothing in life that's worth anything is easy, right? You just have yeah. to keep kind of powering through it and powering through it and powering through it. And if, mm -hmm. if something doesn't come of what you're currently working on, something else is going to come up, yeah. right? So you just can't, and I love, because we start, I don't even know if we recorded this in the beginning, right? Where you said energy you know, it's, I like to keep energy moving, right? Because the more I'm yeah. moving the energy, the more energy comes to you, right? Yeah. Just don't get stuck. Don't stand still, right? Just right. keep moving. Just keep moving. And I think a lot of times too, because there's so many people that follow me and they're like, dude, I'm doing what you're doing. I'm starting a podcast. I'm going to start coaching. I'm going to start, you know, my social <laughs> media platform. I'm doing all this stuff. And I'm like, do it. Go for it. Right. I'm like, it's hard. Wait till you find out that six months into it. Right. It's like, right. Like they don't even realize that they're like three years later, you know, the podcast still doesn't make money. Right. Like right. it's not, you recognize that this is more of a vehicle, right. That allows me or gives me a platform to a help others and then actually start something different. Like I started yeah. coaching people, right? Once my platform built up, right? Oh, but I thought, I thought I was going to be like the podcast king and I was going to have hundreds of thousands of downloads and people are going to be seeking me out to sponsor the show. And it's like, you know, 
crickets. And the ones that did come to seek me out, right? It was like, you know, very, very small budgets. That it, and then you're like, okay, well, I, gotta, I have to pivot. But the most important thing to realize, right, is that you have an audience, right? Mm-hmm. I have an audience. We are actually helping a lot of people. Yeah. And you go through the kind of gr- the grind work of it and you stay in motion. That yeah. energy creates and attracts more energy, yeah. right? And the people that I know in recovery now, and just when, you know, the people listening, and those of you, you know who you are, the only reason I know you is because of the podcast, right? Mm-hmm. I know them because from there they came into the, the share private group. And in there, we started communicating yeah. on that level, right? And so you develop this relationship where from there, those people started to connect with the other people inside the group, right? So it's just yeah. like, I know what I'm doing has yeah. an, uh, just, it's thousands of people, you know? Right. It, isn't, it isn't millions, it is, it's, but it's thousands of people that listen yeah. every week. So it's like, it, it's doing what it's supposed to be doing, right? As yeah, long as but you it's also it's keep, it's, keeping the, it, you know, keeping the faith and doing the uh, footwork. I've been trying to start this Facebook group, the loud and clean recovery talent show. Cause I'm all about like, let's lift each other up. Let's, you know, use, because so many addicts and alcoholics are like super creative people and let's help each other promote our shit. Like let's collaborate on stuff. I'm always trying to get musicians in recovery to score the show. Like let's help each other, you know, like all these people who feel broken and like life has passed us by, like, I want to help those guys, you know, and I want to like allow this, a space to exist or help this space exist for us to collaborate more and support each other more. But Man, it is so hard to get the word out on stuff, you know, but I truly believe, you know, energy creates energy, which is why we're starting shooting again. We're going to start casting again. So if anybody lives in the greater Bay area, who's interested in being on cleaner days, wants to like send me their stuff, just write me a letter, write, go to my website. You can write a letter. And I ask people to sort of share a little bit about their story and just send me a photo. It's not a headshot. You don't have to have acting experience. Just like want to want to be a part of if you've always wanted to be an actor, you know? Um, but mostly I'm looking for people who have, um, have it. It's hard to explain what that thing is, but it's just like, they've lived it. But also, I mean, ultimately, you have to be able to be a good actor. You have to be comfortable on camera. But I'm willing to find that in a person and not expect a headshot because I don't even – I saw so many hundreds and thousands of headshots in L.A. And just because you have a headshot doesn't mean you're a good actor. And it doesn't mean that you have the soul and the richness of experience to bring something to cleaner days, you know? Um, All right. So then so in that case, on that note, yeah, tell our listeners – how they can reach out to you, how they can submit their information, how they can participate, right? Yeah. Give us, give us all the info, Tess. So if you're interested in um, being on the cast, uh, casting at Cleaner Days is just C-L-E-A-N-E-R-D-A-Z-E, like I'm clean, but I'm still in a daze, so you can remember it that way, Cleaner Days. Um, I definitely encourage people to watch the show first so they know what it is. The whole season is available. You can watch it on our YouTube channel, on cleanerdays.com. You can watch it on Facebook. We kind of launched it everywhere so that you can watch it anywhere. Um, But casting at Cleaner Days, if you want to submit music, if you're a musician, um, same thing. But you can also just reach out to me directly, test at Cleaner Days, if you want to talk to me if you're interested in producing investing definitely down for that (laughs) um uh and yeah i mean eventually we want to have like a writer's room we want we see this in multiple cities we'd love to have cleaner days like cleaner days istanbul cleaner days london because there's so many unique drug cultures around the world you know um especially youth drug culture because it's very unique um but we want to grow and evolve and always offer opportunities to people who've lived it. Cause that means everything to me. I love it. I love it. So then yeah. I'm looking right now, right? So I'm actually at 
at cargocollective.com. Oh, that's my personal website. Test that, that's testsuite.com. Okay. Yeah, so I'm going go to I'm put that up. And then there is cleanerdays. Cleaner days. Yeah, that's uh -huh. the okay. shit. That's the that's the the go-to. That's where you can okay. watch everything. You can read it. We also started a nonprofit called Loud and Clean. Mm -hmm. Um, and we hope to do more productions that celebrate recovery and out loud recovery specifically. Um, okay. So there so, is a, yep. I see it here. So there I'm going to post, I'm going to have cleaner days on Tessa's show notes. There's a contact section here as well. So you can contact all the social media is on the website. So yep. it looks like this is, there it is. I'll have that as well. So, uh, oh my goodness. I haven't even liked this yet. Oh, I just clicked liked on the Clean <laughs> Days fan page. Look at how quick we're awesome. Social Thanks. media is the bomb, right? It's like, it's just like, it's instant. <laughs> I know. I love, hate it. I love, hate it. Hate, I love we, it. We all do. We all do. All right. So <laughs> we know how to get a hold of you. If you're in Santa Cruz, I already know a friend. Actually, Gabby, I'm going to, I'm going to put you in touch with, with Gabby. Um, Campania, and she, okay. she's, she's one of my admins in the Share Recovery Network. Are you in the Share Recovery Network? Are you in the big group? Uh, I, I can't remember. I joined about 50 billion recovery groups, um, and uh, I think I am. I think I am. I might not be active in there. We should be. Okay, so here we are. Tess, we're not even friends. Like, hello. Oh, now we are. Now we're best friends. I'm sending this now, right? All right, so I just sent you a fr friend request there. So as soon as, and then, let's see, if, let's see if Tess is in the Share Recovery Network. She might be. I think I, I, I think There's 5,200 people in there. That's awesome. Right? That one's, that I one's I good. Have, I have like 200 in my recovery talent show group that I just started. We have a Cleaner Days page, which has over 2,000, but my recovery talent show has like 200. Takes, yeah, you know, you got to start somewhere. Yes. And that's, that's the challenge. That's the challenge. Okay. So I'm going to add you to that one there too. Right. And then, so then now folks, you will be able to just go to the, to share, go to the share podcast, go to Tessa show notes and I will have everything listed for you so you can get a hold of her, especially if you're, like I said, Gabby's an admin. She's also one of the, uh, the chairs on the share recovery community online meetings. Right. Oh, so, cool. We do all kinds of stuff, man. That's awesome. That is so badass. Yes, yes, it is. It's amazing. But that's what we do. We just keep growing. All right. So, Tess, we're going to start closing up. Are you ready? Okay. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. So, I'm going to ask you five questions about your early recovery, and I want you to respond with inspirational, um, or inspiring okay. answers you can share with our newcomers. Are you ready? Yep. Number one. What was keeping you from getting clean and staying clean or staying clean when you first got introduced to recovery? I thought that it was, meetings were a cult. I thought that NA, I didn't like the language. I didn't like the readings. I didn't like the God word. I couldn't connect. And I just, I have, you know, for many years I did in and out because I just couldn't drink the Kool-Aid. And I think eventually I tried it enough times on my own to appreciate and eventually you hear the message it was like hearing the truth coming from the words of the other people and realizing you know my life's not going to be boring these are all the craziest party animals of all who just you know found a new way to live or they were going to die but it's not a somber bunch you know and I started but that was what honestly that it turned me off at first the language you know and when I work with kids now and I, I try to remind them like don't get but don't like tweak out on the language focus on the truth from you got each other hear the stories hear the likenesses and when it comes down to it at the end of the day those you know I still get irritated in the readings I'm like okay let's get on with it I want to hear from the people you know there is there <laughs> It, it is. It is what you just said there. It's cultish, the language, especially AA, right? Yeah. I mean, I, people, and because I'm one of those people that agrees that it's outdated and it could use a new translation, right? Kind of like the King James Bible, yeah. whatever. You know what I mean? Right. Like it could use an updated, you know, version. 
But man, you yeah. bring that up to AAers, and oh, I mean, oh, I might no. as well have, I might as well have insulted their mother, right? I know, like, you ridiculous. Know, you know, like that. I, I feel like that's coming. You know what I mean? Yeah, everyone's so scared it'll ruin the formula or something. Uh, you know, uh, people will. People might drink over it. Come on. It's unbelievable. You know. <laughs> anyway, don't get me started with that one. But I, I I'll, I'm right there with you. I'm right there with you. Okay. Yeah. So number two, right? At what point did you have a spiritual awakening, that aha moment in recovery? when you accepted that you were powerless over drugs and alcohol, but for the first time had developed a hope that you could recover? Um, I think it happened when I've always struggled with fr having friends or making friends and something happened in early recovery when I was in Berkeley where I just, people reached out to me and I developed this little, a bond with a group of about 15 other new newcomers. And we went to coffee we went, I felt scooped up and loved in a way that shifted my ability to sort of picture myself clean. Um, and that was huge. That was huge. I, you know, I live, now that I live in Santa Cruz and I've moved a bunch, I don't have that same, you know, tight. There's a, there's a certain bond when you get clean with a, a bunch of people. And it was yes. like this magic little cocoon and yes. it shaped and it stuck with me and they were my support, you know, and I'm fr a couple of those people have relapsed, but I'm in touch. The, the main, my main homies, I'll always love them. Like it's like this special golden thread that it just, you know, it's a bond. That's, I think what did it for me was the spiritual connection with some other, you know, other addicts like me who were at the same place. The meetings after the meetings, it's the car rides yeah. there. It's the car rides home. It's going out yeah. afterwards. It's just that bonding that happens. Like yeah. you go to the meetings, right? And sometimes you make it through no matter what. But then after the meeting, you kind of like you're talking to your homies, to your peeps, right? And then that's mm -hmm. where the real magic happens. Totally. And I'm not as good about it anymore. Like, you know, I'm married to a normie. I don't maybe socialize as much in that world. Um, but I did for long enough till I, I mean, I know it was magical and it's just what I needed. And it helped me tremendously at a time when I had never had that. And it meant everything to my recovery. Beautiful. I love it. I love it. Okay. Yeah. So Tess, do you have a favorite book that you would recommend to our newcomers that you read in early recovery? Uh, I think I said it earlier, the community college manual. <laughs> I definitely <laughs> recommend to the newcomer, go grab your community college local. Like if you were anything like me and you just don't have a dream, but you need to like, you know, take a fucking gardening class, a pottery class, something you've never done. You know, I think I took a, um, what was it? It was like edible horticulture thing, you know, it was like, or, you know, jewelry making something just to be teachable, learn something new, feel like young again. Um, and in terms of other books, I mean, I have so many that I love. I think there's one called, I think it's Casher in the Rye, which is Moshe Casher's memoir. It's hilarious. Um, you know, play on words, Catcher in the Rye, it's Casher in the Rye. He's an AA. He's like a comedian. He's big now. I knew him back in the day in San Francisco when he was early in recovery. Now he doesn't know who I am. I've tried to contact him in, on Facebook. And he's too big. He's big for his britches now. He's like big famous guy. But Cashier in the Rye is a good read for addiction memoir. Of course, Amy Dresner's book. Great read. Love love that. But the biggest one, the most important one for me, aside from the... the uh, and a big book, which helped me, which I, you know, the super basic important. text. Yeah. The basic text. Yeah. But that seems boring to say. Doesn't everybody say that? It, well, the thing is that that's, that's for early recovery. That's the, it's almost like, here's yeah. the thing. If I hear it enough times, I might yeah. actually fucking believe it. Right. Yeah. Like, that was the other thing you said too. Like I got clean in NA. Yeah. Uh, the basic text I was reading, I remember reading the, the, the basic text and going, that's me, that's me, that's me, yep. that's me, that's me. The AA one, it was like, where was this written? Okay. That's so, the, 
That was that was that. Okay, so so that's where I connected, right? I I totally. or got clean in NA because yeah. the language fit. High five. Well, yeah, high five, baby. Yeah, all right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so good. So two more questions. What yeah. is the best suggestion you have ever received, Tess? I'd say my, my um, favorite one is play the tape all the way through. Ooh. Play the tape all the way through. I use, I, that's my go-to. I still use that because, you mm -hmm. know, I'm one of those people, one of those fuck-ups who it still sounds good to me sometimes. The desire to use has not been 100% lifted. You know, mm -hmm. when I'm having a tough day, like I'm going through a lot with my mom being sick and my own sickness last year, like all I have to do though is just tell myself, you know, play the tape all the way through. The If I took two pills, the, the bottle would run out and I wouldn't be able to get more. And then I'd end up down by the bridge trying to score heroin and then I would lose everything and then cleaner days would be gone and then I'd be broken and then I'd be in the psych ward. And if I'm lucky, I would be alive, you know? Um, so play the tape all the way through. Play the way, that's, to me, that's the best one there is. It, it's the best one. Cause even if you get high for a minute, you're gonna come down and then it's gonna, everything's gonna suck. So, <laughs> My Play favorite. the tape through. Yep. Okay. So I hope you guys are paying attention to the absolute insanity the test just described, right? <laughs> so she didn't just say play the tape through. She actually described what that looks like. And she yep. has 17 years clean, right? So, so just if you've got six months and you're like, mm -hmm. when are these thoughts going to go away? They're not. Okay, they are part of who you are, and it's a giant warning sign to stop what the fuck you're doing. Okay, mm -hmm. and go to a meeting and share about it. Right, play yeah. the tape through comes beautifully in so many different instances. Right, depending yeah. on what you're what you're about to do, because in mm -hmm. many cases we didn't come in because we wanted to get sober. We came in because we were tired of facing the consequences. So yep. playing the tape through allows you to avoid really massive consequences. For example, job loss, okay? Mm -hmm. Loss, you know, running out of money, okay? Mm -hmm. Divorce, okay? Mm -hmm. Play the tape through, okay? It's not just about sobriety. So beautiful. That was a great little depiction of what that looks like, Tess. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Best. It's the go-to. <laughs> All right, so number five, if you could give our newcomers only one suggestion, what would it be? Um, don't feel bad if you don't know what you want to do or who you are. You know, they say when you get clean, you sort of, or when you started using, you stop growing. And so if you get clean when you're 40, you regress to being 13. You know, I think that's kind of true. And maybe you don't know who you are. Maybe you don't know what you want to do, but that's okay. Open up that community college catalog, point at something, try something new, and eventually you will find a dream. Because when I was young, I always felt bad or separate because I didn't, you know, my mom always said, you can do whatever you dream, follow your dreams, follow your dreams. I didn't have dreams. It took me a while to get a dream. So that's what I like to tell people like, it's okay if you don't have a dream. It's okay if you can't picture your life clean. Just for today, do something that you haven't done before. Be open to the universe guiding you and eventually you'll figure the fuck out something that makes you happy, that makes you like feel like you have a place in the world, you know? But don't be worried if you don't yet. It might take a while. All of that is true right? It doesn't yeah. matter. It is all true, right? You come in and you are, it, it is arrested development. You stop growing mm -hmm. emotionally, right? Mentally and emotionally, you stop once you pick up. And I mean, well, and when I mean pick up, it's that moment where we all know that it stopped being recreational. Right. And it was daily consumption, completely yeah. consumed our lives. All we thought about was yeah. getting and uh, finding ways to get more, and so from yeah. that time span until you got clean is just basically put the brakes on, you know, 
maturing as, 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 as a person. Mm-hmm. So if you did this for 20 years, right. And you started it at 20 and we're done at 40. Yes. Right. I do. You know that it, there is that whole idea of like, Oh my God. Right. The good news sometimes is, sometimes I think, Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, sometimes I question that math though, because I've been clean now almost 17 years I still feel like I'm 18. I still feel all kinds of stunted and I killed a lot of brain cells. So I'm still catching up. I'm 46 now. Is there See? hope? See what I mean, guys? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And we're, th- that's more dark comedy. Okay. Yes. That, that's some yes. dark comedy here because Tess and I are on this call because we're very functional, productive members of societies. We're both married. You know, we both have, you know, these passion projects. We all, you know, are self-supporting based on yep. our own contribution. Okay, so there is that. We're adults, right? We're just sort making, of. Yes, we're making, <laughs> no, but, we're, but, we're, but we wear yeah. that, we, we wear that adolescence, right? Yeah. You know, just, just because we can. Right? It keeps it's, us young. It keeps us young. Hell yeah. Like both of us are, I'm 47, Tess is 46. We both look like we're about yep. 35, right? So yeah. they're, they're in and of its, uh, we're cool, we're hip. We still say fuck a lot. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> it, it's all part of like, that's how life is in recovery. And that mm-hmm. in the sense of like, yes, you got to start from someplace. And it is a tough grind. When we talk about, a 50, 60 year old guy that acts like a six year old in rehab. That's all true. But you, you get a year in recovery and it exponentially changes your level of maturity. You start catching up very, very fast. You start catching totally. up. So don't lose hope, but don't try and speed up the process. Nobody circumvents the deal or the work. Right. Right? Yeah. All it's right. true. All right. <laughs> And also, ultimately, it's about learning how to get out of ourselves and like help start helping other people, which service is what it's all about. We all know that. It's like turn around and help the next guy. When, as I get rich and famous, I'm always going to help the little guy who, and, and try to lend a hand, you know, because I've learned through this process and I don't ever want to forget to help and be of service and um, support where I can, you know, because we all need that. Contribution is key. It's absolutely, yeah. it's the fastest way to get out of yourself. It's the fastest yeah. way to move from sadness, depression, anger, resentment, self-pity. All, you know, you just name it and you yeah. reach out and help somebody else out. It will change totally. how you feel. It will change how you feel. Tess, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Thank you. It was super fun. It was wonderful. And um, if you ever come to Santa Cruz, we definitely have to hook up. To, I'll take you to a meeting or a bike, a bike ride, whatever, whatever you're, whatever you're into. It was wonderful. Or maybe I could do something on cleaner days if I'm there. Oh, fuck yeah. I, you could have a cameo like this. I'd have you Good. come talk to the kids, inspire them. Always down for that. Always down for that. There we go. There we go. All right. Well, I am going to be in LA uh, in January of next year. So of the 2019. So we may have to figure that. We may have to figure that out somehow. I don't know what you're doing. For in sure. January, but I, I don't, I don't what, know yet either. Yeah. But so, I do well, go to LA a lot. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, it, it, regardless, we'll figure something out. We'll figure something out. All right. All right. Tess, we, We have now reached the end of our show. Thanks for joining us. And as we say here in Costa Rica, Pura Vida. Can you give us a Pura Vida? Pura Vida. Wow, that was fantastic. (laughs) That's, That's a wrap.